I'm a family physician in Salmon Arm, which is actually in British Columbia, um, in the sort of north end of the Okanagan Valley in the Shuswap region. And uh, I'm one of the co-founders of CAPE, the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, which is putting on this evening's event with support of a number of other groups uh, uh, of environmental dimension and interest. Before I begin that, I'd like to acknowledge, as we have always done in the pre three previous sessions we did, acknowledge that we are guests on the territory of the Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, and even the Squamish nation. Um, and I also would add that we're not just acting like guests the way we sometimes do. We say we're guests and that's the end of it. We're actually trying to make this session something that will redress some of the bad guest behavior that we've carried out in the past. So, uh, the event is called Voices from the Sacrifice Zone, Fracking in BC's North. And if you just put the second slide up, the reason we're talking about fracking is because that black line, which illustrates new oil and gas uh, exploitation, is fracking. All new oil and gas uh, development has been from what's called unconventional oil and gas, or fracking. You're going to hear some details about what fracking actually is in a moment. We got this event and series of panel discussions um, in five different cities going because Larry and I, Larry Barzilai, who's done much of the organizing work for this, and I went north to northeastern, north, uh, northwestern BC. We went to Dawson City, a little town called Farmington, Fort St. John, Prince George Terrace, and Kitimat, and we saw the trials that people were enduring in those parts of the province, which people down here don't always perceive. And I must admit, in the sessions we've done so far, we've had people express surprise at how dire the situation is. When you turn on the natural gas in your stove or your natural gas furnace, you're, you're taking gas that has been produced uh, in some ways uh, in, in a very unpleasant and unnecessarily harmful way. Tonight, um, we have a panel of speakers, but before our panel is introduced, uh, we're very fortunate to have David Suzuki with us to say a few words to start off. Now, if I just say a few words, you know everything you need, <laughs> well, not everything you need to know, you'll know a fraction, quirks and quarks, the nature of things, 52 books, including 19 for children, and a man who, some of you may remember, there was a documentary that won an Oscar in 1982 called If You Love This Planet. It was about the nuclear holocaust. Anybody remember that? My God, I've never heard so many people know that in one room. <laughs> and I thought perhaps what David Suzuki represents is the sequel to that movie. If you love this planet, follow the path that David Suzuki has laid out for us. David Suzuki. Thank you. Thank you. I too would like to acknowledge that we're here meeting on the traditional unceded territory of the Coast Salish people and uh, always remember that they cared for it for thousands of years uh, and it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to have a chance. Thank you to Cape for asking me to share a few ideas with you. I'm sorry, but I'm not in the greatest of shape and I'm, I'm not going to stay for the whole things. But thank you all for coming down and taking part in the panel. You're the, the critical part of this whole thing. I just wanted to uh, give you a, a bit of background to set the context within which to look at what's happening uh, on the fracking front. We, the basic uh, fact is that we have to get off fossil fuels very, very quickly. Fracking, to me, is the dumbest way to get energy you can imagine. Not only are we taking rock, shattering it by putting water under high pressure, we're lacing that water that we use with chemicals, most of which we don't know what they are because the industry won't, won't tell us, and basically removing that water then 
from use for who knows how many generations. This is just nuts to, uh, to, to use this as a way of, of getting energy. So I just want to relate to you the tragic history of missed opportunities that have led us now to a point where we're absolutely in crisis. And what we do or do not do in the next couple of years could well determine whether the underpinnings of civilization itself are going to remain intact for our children to, uh, to benefit from. So let me give you some simple history. 1884, the discovery of the greenhouse effect by Joseph Fourier. So we've known about the greenhouse effect, global warming, for a long time. And since Fourier's discovery, that area of physics has been exploited, looked at, studied over many, many years, so that by the 1950s, Mikhail Badikov, a Russian climatologist, published several books in his area of expertise. And in uh, one of his books, he said that the big thing to worry about, the effect of these greenhouse gases on the planet's temperature, were what he called positive feedback loops. You start something, and then something kicks in that accelerates what, uh, what those original gases have done. And he pointed out back in the 1950s, for example, that the loss of Arctic sea ice would allow greater absorption of heat and accelerate global warming. And we're finding now that's exactly what is happening in the Arctic as the sea ice no longer isn't, isn't there as long and fails to reflect a lot of the heat back into the atmosphere. Now, 1965, Frank Eichard, who was the president of the American Petroleum Institute, okay, this is the big organization, in 1965, I want to quote from a speech he gave. There is still time to save the world's people from the catastrophic consequence of pollution, but time is running out. Carbon dioxide is being added to the Earth's atmosphere by the burning of coal, oil, and natural gas at such a rate that by the year 2000, the heat balance will be so modified as possibly to cause changes in climate beyond local or even national efforts. So he said it all. In 1965, the petroleum industry knew that we were heading towards a crisis if we didn't get off fossil fuels. In 1977, Exxon scientist James Black reported, and I quote, Mankind is influencing the global climate through carbon dioxide release from the burning of fossil fuels. This guy was working for Exxon. And in 1982, Exxon scientists warned avoiding uh, potentially catastrophic events would, and I quote, require major reduction in fossil fuel consumption, combustion. 1988 to me was the uh, point, the critical time when the environment was recognized around the world as one of the highest priorities. 1988, Margaret Thatcher was filmed picking up litter in London and she turned to camera and said, well, I'm a greenie too. 1988, a guy ran for president of the United States and said, if you vote for me, I will be an environmental president. His name was George H.W. Bush. There'd he didn't have a green bone in his body, but he said it because Americans demanded that he say it. In 1988, a guy named Brian Mulroney was re-elected, and to show his commitment to the environment, he appo appointed his brightest star to be the Minister of the Environment, a man named Lucien Bouchard. I interviewed Lucien three months after he was appointed, and I said, what have you found is the most important environmental issue confronting Canadians today, and immediately he said, global warming. That was impressive. I said, how serious do you think it is? And this, these are his exact words. It threatens the survival of our species. We have to act now. 1988, the politicians had heard. 1988, 300 scientists gathered in Toronto 
at a meeting that Ken Hare, a uh, climatologist, had called. And there, the scientists were absolutely convinced the evidence was in. Humans were creating global warming. And they issued a press release at the end of the conference that said, global warming represents a threat second only to nuclear war. And they called for a 20% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in 15 years. That was it. That was the call. The science was in. And they, here was a concrete target. If we had taken that seriously, we would be far past the, uh, the, the kind of concerns that we have now. The um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, was established that year by the United Nations in 1988 to publish every five years a report on the state of the atmosphere. This was to be the most credible organization and authority on climate change or global warming. The problem is it's an intergovernmental panel. And although their studies are all based on science, the actual report is vetted by every country that was interested. It included Saudi Arabia, it included Russia, included the United States, which means that each report was a, as conservatively based as you could get. And every report that's come out every five years since they were set up has always fallen way below the actual hap what actually happened. Their predictions were very conservative and always underestimated what would happen. The, um, in uh, 1992, we had the Earth Summit in Rio, the largest gathering of heads of state ever in human history. But then George Bush revealed his true colors. He said, I'm not going to go to that meeting. You're going to try to impose these big restrictions on, on fossil fuel use. And so he was begged to come. And he said, OK, I'll come down. But you've got to have a different target than what was called for in 1988. So in 1992, the, the Earth Summit said, we will try to stabilize 1990 levels by the year 2000. And that bought his arrival. Americans were, were humiliated. A lot of Amer American activists, I was there, marched with signs calling out George Bush as a complete uh, bad guy. And um, the, um, oh, I missed out. Oh, yes. In 1997, of course, we had the major gathering in Kyoto. And at that conference, the industrialized world accepted that we had caused the problem of global warming with our tremendous use of fossil fuels. And it wasn't fair to the developing world, like China and India and all the other countries. It wasn't fair for us to say, no, you can't do, you can't do what we've already done. You've got to stop producing or generating fossil fuels. The industrialized world said, it's our responsibility. We caused it. We've got a responsibility to cap our emissions and reduce by uh, 5 to 6 percent by 2010. So that was the agreement. And uh, 192 countries signed on. Of course, as soon as we signed, uh, the uh, fossil fuel industry was saying, this isn't fair. Why aren't China and India here? Why, we want a, a made in Canada plan, all this kind of baloney. But listen to this. The, the American Petroleum Institute, which in, I read the quote from Frank Eichard in 1965, saying by the year 2000, you know, it may be beyond our control. By 1998, the American petroleum industry took a very different position from the one in 1965. In 1988, they said, quote, it's not known for sure whether A, climate change is actually occurring, and B, if it is, whether humans really have an influence on it. When people say they really have an influence on it, when people say there are evil things in this world, I believe that's one of the classic examples. In the name of profit, they spent 
hundreds of millions of dollars, the fossil fuel industry, funding right-wing think tanks, funding groups and organizations and scientists to say, it's not real. We're not causing it. It's a natural cycle. It's sunspots or whatever. And it worked, all in the name of profit. In um, 2002, Canada ratified Kyoto. And Jean Chrétien was the prime minister. He wrote a letter to our foundation thanking us for being among environmentalists, for making it possible for him to do the, the signing. And uh, when Russia then ratified the next year, it became international law. And um, Canada enacted a few, a few uh, law, like some legislation to get people to insulate their homes more and uh, fuel efficiency in cars. Nothing really big to try to meet the target that was laid out in 1988, but they, they did a, a few things. February 2008, Stephen Harper was elected prime minister. And uh, he immediately canceled the modest the modest uh, acts that Cray Chen and Paul Martin had enacted to reduce uh, emissions. Stephen Harper canceled the research that was scheduled for studies of climate change in the Arctic. He pulled out all of his support for the experimental lakes area in northern Ontario, one of the most famous and important areas where they have dozens and dozens of lakes that they've experimented on to show acid rain and, and the effect of climate change and, and so on. It's a very famous uh, research area, and Harper pulled all the federal support out of it, trying to get it to shut down. But Manitoba and Ontario stepped up and put the funding into it and have kept it going. He banned government scientists from speaking out to the public unless they were vetted and the government, the prime minister's office knew what they were going to say. He, in the name of efficiency, of bringing libraries together, he ordered the discarding, the throwing away of massive amounts of primary fundamental data about climate. And he called it reducing emissions to avoid climate change crazy economics. He said if we get involved in that, it will destroy the economy. So by that simple statement, Stephen Harper elevated the economy above the very atmosphere that gives us air to breathe, that gives us weather, climate, and the seasons. In 2011, Harper pulled Canada out of the uh, Kyoto Agreement, the only country to do that. And by that signaled that we don't care about international promises or commitments. As a Canadian, I felt humiliated by that act of our government. 2015, the sun came out. Justin Trudeau was elected, and within months, only a few months, he attended the COP21 meeting in Paris. And he did us great pride. He said, Canada is, ba Canada is back, sign the agreement with a flourish, that is to try to limit emissions to keep temperature rising between 1.5 and 2 degrees, and then said, we want to try to keep our emissions so that the temperature will be closer to 1.5 than 2. And he deserved all of the accolades and the celebration that we, we had for him. That was a great commitment to bring Canada back and to commit to that 1.5, or that is our, our basic target. Environmentalists uh, urge, yeah. So after uh, 2015, environmentalists were on the bandwagon. We thought we had it made now. We had a great guy, the sun was out, and we were urging uh, all kinds of action now to, uh, to try to meet the target we committed to in Paris. And yet the, uh, the, governments, uh, the government of British Columbia, under Christi, Christy Clark, of course, was heavily promoting frack gas and liquefied frack gas. I prefer to call it LFG to LNG. 
as uh, the economic uh, future of, of uh, the country. And they, the idea was, we'll, we'll frack the gas here, but we'll send it to China and allow China to use what has a, a lower carbon footprint, a transition fuel, to get China off uh, coal and all those bad emissions. But of course, we now know that there are fugitive emissions that accompany uh, fracking, and those, uh, mu much of that fugitive emissions is methane, which is a much more potent greenhouse gas than, uh, than uh, um, natural gas or, well, okay, I won't say coal, John, because you, you say I can't say that. It's got a heavy carbon footprint. It's not a transition fuel. The, uh, in 2018, the federal government invested in Kinder Morgan, bought a pipeline on behalf of all Canadians. They don't see that apparently as a subsidy for the fossil fuel industry. But uh, despite uh, objections uh, to the Energy Review Board, which was uh, reorganized or said to be reorganized, Trudeau announced in 2018 that uh, the indigenous and environmental issues will be dealt with by the new NEB. And once they've done their deliberations, then we'll build a pipeline. So he already knew what he wanted. And, uh, you know, the, all of this other stuff was simply cosmetic. All the while, emissions have continued to climb. On October 2018, that's last year, an IPCC special report came out that was a shocker. Because unlike all of its previous publications, this one called us, us said that we were in a, an emergency situation and that we needed to make massive cuts. And those cuts were massive because we hadn't done anything since back in 1988 to try to meet uh, some kind of targets. 19, last year, they told us that if temperature rises above 1.5, uh, above pre-industrial levels by the end of this century. Th there are just too many unknowns that all hell is going to break loose and that essentially the underpinnings of civilization will be threatened. Many scientists are now saying that 90, 95% of humanity will be gone by uh, the year 2000. And, um, sorry, 2100. So they, uh, they made the call then that uh, we have to reduce our energy use, our fossil fuel emissions by 45% by 2030 and by 100% by 2050. That is the call. That is a very, very tough target to aim at. The, uh, a day after that report came out, and there was a lot of public publicity about it in the papers, on television. The day after that report came out, demanding really heroic change, marijuana became legal in Canada. And guess what? That whole issue disappeared. It was just pushed to the back pages and then out of the newspapers. So April 2nd, a report came out from the Canadian uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada that uh, uh, told us that surveying the literature now, all of the literature that's out, that temperature in Canada is rising twice as fast as the global average, and that in the Arctic, it's rising three times as fast as the global average. And this means that we are really at the forefront of feeling. We've known that in British Columbia, for God's sake. You remember when our forests turned red from the outbreak of the mountain pine beetle? We lost tens of billions of dollars of pine trees from that because the pine beetles are not, not killed because our winters aren't cold enough to keep them under control. And then when we heard of forest fires, you know, go to Kelowna and ask anyone, is climate change really happening? You're damn right it is. And, uh, of course, we felt the impact on the air here in Canada. So uh, what happened with this report that just came out on April 2nd? Well, guess what? It was on page four of the Globe and Mail. 
It was in the, uh, on the Vancouver Sun, it was in the second section. I guess that's the news section on the third page. So, I mean, I go over and over again, what we're being faced with an existential crisis. We're talking about whether these young children are going to be able to live out a full life. And we're still dithering about it and putting it to the third or fourth page in our newspapers. This is, this is why meetings like this are important. Find out about fracking. But fracking is just a part of the whole big crisis. And that is, we've got a crisis of human use of, of, of fossil fuels that has created something. We've already set the experiment in motion. We can't take the carbon out of the atmosphere that we've put it up there put up there, and it's going to take decades for this all to shake out to where we are now. But, you know, let me end by saying, I used to say, I feel like I'm in a giant car heading at a brick wall at 100 miles an hour, and everybody in the car is arguing about where they want to sit. <laughs> Someone's got to say, for God's sake, put the brakes on and turn the wheel. But I no longer use that metaphor anymore. I now use the metaphor of, of uh, uh, Roadrunner. You know Roadrunner, the little bird? And he's running away from Wiley Coyote and he sees the edge of the cliff. And just when he gets to the edge, he does a 90 degree turn and, and takes off. But Wiley Coyote's got so much momentum, he goes right over the edge. And you know there's that second when he realizes, oh shit, and then down he goes, right? We are there. We're not at the edge of the cliff. We can't do what Roadrunner did. We're over the edge. But that's not an excuse for not doing anything. It makes a big difference whether we fall five feet or 500 feet. And so this is a challenge to realize. There's no talking about, is it going to happen? It's happening. And the question is, are we just going to continue to pile it on and make the problem worse and worse for future generations, all in the name of profit? And if you look at the consequences of the SNC Lavalin scandal. To me, the thing that comes out of that scandal is, look at the power corporations have. They hold governments hostage by threatening to fire people or to lay off people or to move their headquarters. And if you think SNC-Lavalin is a big company, think of the fossil fuel industry. They've got governments by the shorts all over the place. And the only way I can see getting out of this is, we need a massive movement now to get politicians realizing they're serving us. This is no longer partisan. We want every party to say climate change is the existential issue that we've got to get going on yesterday. And so we've got till October 21st to bring that about. Sorry to have gone on so long. Thank you for... <laughs> I don't think there's anybody in this room or in this country who could give the big overview of the scientific supports for action on climate change than David Suzuki. What we're going to hear now is not the overview, but the life-threatening picture on the ground for people who live in the epicenter of the part of this province where fracking takes place most intensively, and that is in northeastern BC. And the reason we did this, we started this tour was because we saw when Dr. Barzlai and I went up to the, the northeast, northwest of BC, we saw how people were living and the effects that were taking place in their lives. And they said to us, we live in the sacrifice zone. It was their term. And we thought, maybe we should hear, people down here could hear their story and understand why it's not just a question of climate change, the big picture, it's also a question of the lives of individual people in this province subjected to pressures that none of us in this room would be comfortable with in our own lives. <clears throat> so we have a panel, and uh, the panel tonight will begin uh, with some words from an environmental scientist, Karen Levin, 
who for 15 years worked in the mining industry, which has made all the mistakes it could possibly make and therefore become regulated, except on occasion when a Mount Pauly happens, but in general terms is much more tightly controlled than the fossil fuel industry is today. And when she ended up being engaged by the Taltan people to work on issues related to oil and gas, she was astonished to see how little regulation there was. So Karen is going to talk to you about that absent regulation. Karen. What's that? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Warren. I'm uh, honored and grateful to be here tonight. Uh, why am I here? Well, um, as fate would have it, Dr. Meyer is my neighbor. So that's my connection to Cape. Um, and as well, this map right here behind me, this is uh, where I call home, the peace region where I live with my husband and two children who are eight and nine. Um, these red dots represent uh, the number of constructed wells since 2005. Uh, currently, there are approximately 28,000 wells in the Peace Region. And with the new LNG, there, it's predicted that there will be up to 100,000 new wells constructed. So last June, uh, my, we received notification that Encana was proposing uh, the construction of a multi-well pad less than a kilometer from our house, which would be fracked. They're probably fracking underneath my house as we speak. Um, we received notification of consultation as well as a bus tour and um, uh, additional notifications and cons consultations um, from the proponent. Once I did a little bit of research and realized, dug a little deeper, I realized that there's actually no responsibility on the proponent to do either environmental work or take any responsibility for the environmental impacts. And that's when I knew I needed to come south and help spread the word of what's actually happening in the Northeast. What is hydraulic fracturing? Uh, Mr. Suzuki uh, touched on that briefly, but it's basically the um, process of forcing fluid um, under pressure down a drill hole and fracturing and smashing the rocks deep underground, thousands of meters under the ground. And this basically, they use a propent, a sand, and it basically, and chemicals, a chemical mixture, and it basically displaces the gas and forces it to the surface. On the surface, uh, it requires 200 truckloads of water to actually make this happen, a truck that injects uh, this mixture into the ground. And once it's forced up, there's wastewater, there's storage tanks, and trucks to take it off the site. Next slide, please. The fracking fluid is where much of the controversy lies. The fluid's a mixture of approximately 90% uh, water, 8 to 9% prop into her sand, and anywhere from 0.5 to 2% uh, chemical mixture. This can vary from location to location based on the geology. Um, basically, the um, companies trademark this chem these chemicals and this mixture, and you don't know exactly by what percentage you're dealing with here. It could be 2% benzene or 30%, who really knows? Next slide, please. Some of the environmental impacts uh, related to hydraulic fracturing are surface and groundwater impacts, air quality impacts, uh, impacts to fish and wildlife, cumulative effects, methane pol pollution and its impact on climate change, exposure to toxic chemicals, blowouts due to gas explosion, waste of disposal, large volumes of water used in water-scarce areas, and fracking-induced earthquakes. Next slide, please. Um, directly, we'll talk to water here. You have direct contamination. You have wastewater management. I think this is a telling slide. Actually, in the oil and gas industry, they're not even required to use liners, so this uh, mixture can actually be placed right on the ground, which to me, coming from mining, where you need double-lined uh, uh, wastewater areas as well as berms, it's just pretty much mind-blowing. Um, they have inadequately or sealed, inadequately sealed or abandoned wells. There's all those dots up there. I'm sure a lot of them have been abandoned. Um, Reinjection of the process water right back into the ground and capped, if you can believe it. Accumulation of toxic and radioactivity act, active uh, materials in sediments uh, near disposal sites, and again, over extraction of water in water scarce areas. Next slide, please. 
Uh, here we have wildlife impacts. This is a great slide. It's actually from the United States, and these are antelope. But you can see how the interactions become very close when you're actually in wild areas. Um, you have wastewater storage, where obviously it's easy, easily accessible to wildlife. They drink it. It's toxic. Uh, you can fill in the gaps. Uh, the air dispersion of chemicals onto vegetation, they consume it um, through that intake. There's reproductive implications and premature death, fragmentation of their hab habitat. Uh, pipeline corridors open up the habitat to predator and hunting access, as well as the uh, fracturing-induced seismic activities, which obviously would alter anyone's habitat and disturbs them. Next slide, please. The air quality impacts, um, uh, you have toxic chemical release, you have uh, diesel exhaust, which is a known carcinogen as well. You have silica or the sand that's used as a propent. You also have nitrogen oxide and methane, which are contribute to global warming. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a slide speaking directly to climate change impacts, and as we just heard from Mr. Suzuki, that it's been touted as clean energy, which is not true. Um, we are told that it's going to reduce the, our carbon impact. Uh, this is actually measured in million metric tons, and it's from a study, uh, the U U.S. fugitive um, methane, or yeah, methane emissions from 2012. You can see on... Uh, your left, the 157 million meg uh, megatons was actually what was predicted that the impacts of natural gas would have to the atmosphere, but actually when they calculated in the impact of the methane, it actually turns out to 1,414 million metric tons. Um, when dealing with methane, it's actually equivalent to between 35 and 315 coal burning power plants. Methane has the potential to trap over 100 times the heat in, uh, around our Earth over 100 years, um, more than carbon dioxide. Next slide, please. This is a picture of the exposure pathways of oil and gas, and it's actually from the BC government's Human Health Report from 2014. It states that there's insufficient information at this time to move forward. Um, however, it did recommend 14 different, it had 14 different recommendations. To this date, none have been addressed and nothing's been done about it. Um, I'd like to mention at this time, I'm not anti-industry. However, I do believe uh, um, industry does need to develop projects in a socially and environmentally responsible manner. Um, when they wanted to, uh, when we got the consultation notification, um, Ulrika went to work on writing a response. You only have 21 days, by the way, if you want the company to actually respond to you, and it was a busy time of year, as it always is in life. And uh, I went to work on a 10-page technical report stating all the environmental impacts uh, that I thought and that we, I wanted a, at least a year's worth of environmental baseline studies done before they started the development to make sure my family was safe. Um, they did not complete any of these studies, and eight months later, and right now, they're developing that multi-well site behind my house. People feel powerless, and um, um, also that if you're not the direct landowner, you have no ability to appeal the process. So many of these landowners, if you own a piece of land and they say, hey, I'm going to give you some money, do you mind if we build something? You say yes, you're the only person that can appeal that permit, which is unbelievable. We also had 50 letters of concern and opposition from our neighborhood. I forgot to mention that. Um, one of the great examples of the lack of concern for wildlife is it was deemed in our area to be a regionally critical winter range for elk uh, habitat, as well as a fish and wildlife management area. The project was allowed to proceed without any elk baseline information, uh, no monitoring and no mitigation plans, and no closure once they went, no um, follow up monitoring after they were done the development. It shows that the government regulations are not protecting our wildlife or our environment or ourselves, and it shows a complete disrespect for wildlife and wildlife habitat. I thought it would be interesting to put up a slide just to see where actually uh, fracking has been banned or the moratoriums. In Scotland, they actually did a cost-benefit analysis, and they deemed it not worth the risk. To, because the risks to uh, human health and the environment far outweigh the cost of the money, like what the economic return would be. 
In Canada, most of the moratoriums, they're still saying, no way, until we get more information, you're not doing anything here. Next slide, please. Um, uh, hydraulic fracturing started approximately 20 years ago on a large scale. Um, the long-term long effects are still not understood. Our government and industry are rec recklessly proceeding when inadequate human environmental information is not available. I worked in the mining industry for approximately 21 years, and the stand standards between the two are like night and day. Uh, for example, when I worked for a major mining company, the, my budget for environment alone was $5 million. I think in, uh, for the project that uh, the Incana Corporation, they have one wildlife biologist per year, which is not even a biologist, a technician, so probably around $70,000. Um, we've had 100 years to learn from the mistakes of mining, the mining industry, and our laws and practices have evolved uh, accordingly. If you look up at this picture, the Galore Creek project, the scale there is about 40 kilometers for just that project. And if you look at the Peace region, it's the scale there is about 120 kilometers. So you can see that it's quite a bit larger. Uh, what is happening in the Peace region right now is at best extremely negligent. Before I go, I'll just leave you with a few recommendation of my recommendations. I believe our laws need to change. We need to change, place the responsibility of adequate baseline environmental studies, Aboriginal and community engagement on the proponent prior to development. Large scale or multi-small oil and gas development projects should require review under the Environmental Assessment Act. Um, the Ensi Environmental Assessment Act need to be amended to capture oil and gas act activities that will trigger the environmental assessment process. Right now in mining, it's tons per day or footprint. There's nothing in a reviewable, under a reviewable project under the Environmental Assessment Act from 2012 that will do that for oil and gas. And lastly, we need to complete a regional cumulative effects study. Thank you. The uh, points that uh, Karen mentioned was that there was an environmental review done by Encana of the winter habitat, the winter habitat range. Where do, when do you think the biologist went up for the one day inspection he did? Middle of June. To my, the best of my knowledge, that is not winter, even up north. Our next speaker is um, a family physician from Dawson City, Ulrike Meyer. Dawson Creek. They look the same from here when I'm looking south. Thank you. <laughs> um, Dawson Creek is in the epicenter of the fracking invasion. The, the, of the, of the 100,000 new wells that are going promised, uh, most of them will be going around that area because it's directly over the Montney Shale, which is the largest natural gas deposit in British Columbia. Uh, Ulrike has noted over the last few years that there are adverse health effects impinging on patients she sees and collected by some of her colleagues with respect to the kind of health problems they're dealing with. So Ulrike Meyer is going to tell you about that. Ulrike. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out and listening to us. And uh, thank you for the introduction, Warren. I feel that it is as healthcare professional, we have the mandate to promote and to protect the public health and well-being. This also means to speak up and to inform. I do have a strong connection to nature and see the interwoven connection of our well-being with the well-being of the environment. There's a connection between the events and changes in the north of the province to the rest of the province, to the rest of the country and world. This led to our tour to the south of the province with help and engagement of CAPE and the hope for your support in voicing our concerns and to demand changes to the oil and gas industry and the policy makers. For the demographics, could I get the first slide, please? I just will go on and explain. Northern Health Authority, if you would look on the map, is a two-thirds almost from the province. We have around 330,000 people living in the size of France. That represents Northern Health Authority. We are to the northeast, close to the Alberta border. And then Dawson Creek is part of the south piece, maybe 30,000 to 35,000 people catchment area. Tumblr Ridge Chatman probably doesn't mean much to you. <laughs> we noticed some health flags. And um, 
which are for concerns to the health of the population living in the northeast of the province. My colleague diagnosed his 10th case of glioblastoma last summer and was quite upset. He worked for many years in South Africa and felt that the incidence was quite high. Glioblastoma is a primary malignant brain tumor among the most disabling and lethal types of cancer. It is incurable and median survival is 15 months in spite of therapy. In the past, it constituted 2% of brain tumors in the 50s and 80s, and now probably around 15%. More men than women are affected. Peak incidence is between 45 and 65 years of age, but it can affect younger people too. Risk factors we know is exposure to ionizing radiation, and it increases the risk of brain tumors, so you could get that from radiation treatment if you have a cancer atomic bombs, which we luckily don't have going off, and natural occurring radioactive material. You have slides. Oh, look at that. <laughs> okay, so there you can see the green region is the Northern Health Authority, and it's a big part of the province. Like living down here, it's hard to imagine how much area it covers. When we look at uh, natural occurring radioactive material, it's called NORM, which is brought back up with the wastewater during the fracking process because it goes through rock formation where natural occurring radioactive material is existing. Hard to know if there's a connection or not, but it would be nice to have independent research in it. The second big flag was that our internist, Dr. Sakaria, he worked for two years in Dawson Creek and left us earlier this year. And in this period, he diagnosed 10 cases of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Idiopathic means we do not need, know the reason why this person developed it. Uh, fibrosis means your lung gets scarred. They look like honeycombs, and you cannot exchange air. So you feel really breathless. And uh, it's an irreversible loss of your pulmonary function, and your median survival is two to five years, and any therapy won't change that much at all. Uh, incidents, the best data came from the UK because you could get fibrosis of your lungs due to uh, autoimmune diseases or exposure to asbestos, and they made really clear case of accurate diagnosis. It was 4.6 per 100,000. So if I extrapolate that to the region in northeast or south Peace, we would expect 1.5 cases per 30,000, not 10 per 30,000. Overall, there's a rising incidence, particularly in highly industrialized regions of countries. And autopsy studies on people who died of uh, pulmonary, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis that selected or uh, looked at the lymph nodes close to the lungs. And they found that there were higher levels of aluminum and uh, silica. And silica is one of the main ingredients of the frac sand too. Is there a connection? We don't know. But it would be nice also to look deeper in it. I have also, can I get the next slide, please? I brought you two cases for time. Charlie is a farmer, 70-year-old, living on a farm outside Dawson Creek, non-smoker, and he loves to dance. He can dance two and a half hours non-stop to the delight of the ladies. <laughs> he came in 2014 to the office and said he had these intermittent episodes where he feels like he's losing consciousness that escalated that he actually lost consciousness over the month, and then it was witnessed by his wives and friends while he was playing cards, slumming over the table. Then he developed decrease in his memory and energy too. His exam was no normal, I couldn't find anything, maybe a little bit low blood pressure, and his history, medical history didn't contribute much to it. He was investigated uh, with many investigations which were all negative and he was referred to internal medicine locally and also to cardiovascular uh, services in Edmonton and had many emergency room visits. When I looked in his and asked him about his environmental history, uh, he told me that half a mile from the house there's a four-well pet with fracking and flaring going on. And then two miles southwest from his house, down the hill, there was large holding tanks with wastewater, and in the winter they would attach propane heaters, and the steam would just slowly come up the hill to his house. And um, when I followed him up, and in December 2016, he said, I'm feeling well, the best in five years, and conclusion, when the tanks were removed, and the well non-active, his health improved. Next slide, please. 
Second case is Bernie. She's a 74-year-old woman living on a farm outside Dawson Creek. She was overall, overall well and fit, had no significant past medical history. She presented uh, with numbness and tingling both legs below her knees, and she mentioned it feels like walking on the felt pads. She has no sensation to be on the ground. She had a normal exam, and she was uh, sent out by my colleague to her undergo nerve conduction studies and wanted to know the results when she came in, and actually they were within normal limits. When I, next slide, please. When I asked her about her environmental history, she states that the compressor station is situated above her house on the property boundary, and that below her house and property is a big open body of water on fire 24-7. I informed her that maybe there is a connection, but I had no follow-up with her. When we look at biometric data, which is looking into humans, and if we find some markers, we had the privilege to have Dr. Elise Corombaudoin coming from the University of Montreal to Dawson Creek, and she was a PhD student at that time and had funding for a pilot study for 30 pregnant women. She collected urine hair samples, and the concentration of benzene biomarker, a known endocrine disrupting chemical or hormone disruptor, also carcinogenic, in the urine of pregnant women, total over three times higher than other Canadian in five out of 30. High exposure to benzene during your pregnancy is associated with low birth weight, increased risk of childhood leukemia, greater incidence of birth defects. Her second part of the study revealed that median hair levels of barium, strontium, aluminum, and manganese were higher in study participant compared to reference levels. All these trace metals are naturally occurring in the Montney Formation. This was 26 out of 29 women, and the indigenous women had higher level than the non-indigenous women. She was thinking that perhaps these women were exposed to these trace metals through air, dust, or drinking water. There needs to be more research. Other research done by environmental scientist Dr. Judy Krasankowski noted higher lung cancer, respiratory illness, and mortality rates in northeastern BC compared to the Canadian average in northwest BC. Can you put up the next slide, please? Oh, perfect. Thank you. So as you can see in the left, you have the, for instance, the lung cancer mortality on the purple bar, and then you go through BC, Vancouver, northwest, and northeast BC, and all the bars are higher in the northeast. This is data then from, uh, collected from 1997 and 2002 and 2005. Um, I don't have any current data. It seems a little bit hard to obtain and to put it in this form, but it would be interesting because in our region, in, north, uh, in the south piece in 2004, the fracking really started full tilt. We'll come to my conclusion. I think with the approval of the LNG facility in Kitimat, there will be more UNGD upstream in the northeast of the province to meet the demands. And as Karen mentioned, there will be proposed of maybe way, way more wells going down to meet that demand. It would be good to have a full public inquiry into the hazards to human health, drinking water, air, and environment. The industry needs to be regulated and accountable for current damage and adverse outcomes. The industry needs to prove to the public that they are not causing harm, not the other way around, that we have to prove to them they're doing harm. Any multi-well pads, holding tanks, compressor station should be set at least 1,600 meters back from any residence and should be the rule, as the greatest health hazard is within the one-mile zone. The current distance is 100 meters from a residence. For wind turbine, that setback is 1,300 meters, and it's regulated. It's really hard to get a cancer rate from the public sources at the moment, but we will work on that too. And uh, the other point is we have to look at the boomtown effects leading to low education levels, increased drug use, increased sexually transmitted infection rates, increase of criminal activity, poverty, and the slow deterioration of the community. There's also gang activity and lots of men camps around. There needs to be independent studies on the health from UNGD. The Oil and Gas Commission is not independent from the industry. 
and cannot fulfill their mandate to protect the public and the environment and the interest of the industries. Would you ask the fox to watch over your chicken coop? One last thought and quote I found in Dr. Warren Bell's article, solastalgia, a term that connotes the sense of painful loss of one's home while still living in it. Thank you. So you've heard from David Suzuki the overview. You've heard from our last two speakers some of the general principles that apply, the lack of regulatory control on the one hand, and some very concerning health effects that are emerging in the population in the center of the area where fracking is taking place. Our next speaker is taking it right down to the ground level. Carl Matson is a fifth generation farmer from a town bang on the border between Alberta and British Columbia, which shows you that borders don't have much to do with the way people behave because the pipelines and things cross all around him and the border is no impediment. But Carl has a unique gift and that is that he has an artistic bent and that art he's bent by art. <laughs> And that's been one of the ways that he has dealt with the tragedy that is inflicting itself on his life. So we're delighted to have Carl speak to us tonight. Carl. Thanks. Yeah, so I'm Carl, farmer, um, artist, and unfortunately, sometimes an activist. Next slide. I was born uh, in Rolla, just about 16 kilometers north of Dawson Creek. and. Uh, yeah, I have often say that I've moved a half a mile in my life. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. I don't know. But I uh, spent my whole life there. Next slide. Um, yeah, I grew up there. It was a way of life as a kid. Uh, I did all the things that farm kids do, animals, tractors, all that stuff, uh, making hay, all that. And uh, when, I, when I was a teenager, my parents said we'd broke some land and stuff like that, and they'd we'd become kind of a, an up-and-running uh, cattle operation. Next, please. Um, yeah, I worked at, when I was a little older, I was, uh, started to work on a series of farms as a, like a midwife, I guess you call it, calving cows. And uh, night shift uh, worked seasonally so I could continue to get paid. And uh, I eventually took over the family farmhouse, which was, uh, that's the old, farmhouse there, built by an axe from an old relative, and that's now where I live. Same house, just a bunch of weird additions. <laughs> and uh, Yeah, so I still live there. My parents still live on the same farm, and I help them out, and I farm myself. Next, please. Um, I've always been an artist, and I always made, I used to make art for, for art for uh, personal expression. And uh, there's a sculpture I did in the traffic circle in Dawson Creek. Um, my mother was a well-known artist, is a well-known artist in North, and uh, let me be creative and encouraged it. And uh, yeah, I always used found objects from the farm and bones and all sorts of strange things that I found around there. But uh, yeah, next slide, please. So my art has shifted and uh, it was due to the, you know, the attention to industry. Uh, I noticed about 15 years ago, lots of new traffic, wells, rigs. Um, it got really aggressive around my place. Um, I call it the year of the flaring. There was really, really aggressive flaring around my, right around my farm. Sometimes the windows would rattle so much that I'd pack my family up and we'd head out. And uh, in 2008, my H2S monitor that I Purchased myself went off at my kitchen table. A uh, leak was detected. It was really tricky to find information on that leak. Um, my neighbors reported being ill. And so together we, we looked into it and there was a leak and we did get the report. And it was, a, it was actually fairly serious. Um, the photo is, uh, over the years, I, as part of my art, I used to go to a lot of public events and meetings and 
small grassroots uh, groups firing up. I would film them, document them. I've, I have lots of boxes of documents. That is a photo next to my house of a, an explosion that I filmed that I really did get no report from. Um, and that was, as the sun was setting, it just got blacker and blacker with uh, soot. I started documenting things fairly heavily. Next, please. And uh, then my art really started to shift. Um, this was my wake-up call. Uh, I'd been voicing my concerns for years. My daughter was about to be born. Uh, that was the year of the flaring. A lot of it really aggressive. And uh, we had a really abnormal amount of twins on the farm. And the strange part, it was the same herd, same bulls, same cows. And I have read some articles on that, that usually you expect, you know, death and stillborns and stuff. But this particular year, we had 22 sets of really healthy twins and, and a very, fairly serious mutation. And that survived for a few minutes. And uh, it kind of woke me up what happened, what was different this year. So uh, finding my voice, I started to get very concerned with the lack of health, you know, worried about health and safety for my family and uh, emergency response plans. This is what we get as farmers for our fridge and it has a shelter in place in it, which is like, uh, part of that is taping your windows and doors in the event of emergency. We have about two helicopters in the area. The, the plan is really, it's just not adequate. Um, so I was in a tribunal as well a couple of years ago trying to, uh, I was trying to get equipment for farmers, but uh, I failed at that. Um, I did a lot of filming out and about, and in 2010 there was a film about my, the struggle, and that's where my art comes back in here. Next slide, please. I started building my own evacuation devices. Uh, basically above ground bunkers. Uh, they have air supply. They're not, you know, completely realistic. You know, they do work, but it's a, it's a prototype of an idea. It's my response to the lack of a proper emergency response plan around my farm. That's the family model. And then as life goes on, that's the bachelor model. <laughs> yeah, but uh, next. And mixed media, my art is all shifted to this. And unfortunately, that is another life pod, and that's the vessel. That one actually works as well, but you know, if, if you don't get rescued, you, can, you could stay in that one. Uh, next, please. Um, what I find is uh, for individuals like myself uh, that are concerned or small groups that fire up to raise awareness is we are completely overwhelmed um, with what's happening, uh, reaching out. We, we get so much literature as landowners about new development that we really can't keep up. We're not scientists, we're farmers. Um, there's not a real great support system. I've found that a lot of farmers are actually considering leaving um, because of the, just how aggressive it is. And, um, yeah, it's, yeah, next slide. I call it the Wild West there. Um, part of my tribunal, my little court case I went to is because I had a sour gas high pressure line right next to my house, 90 meters. I, I took issue with that and I found out that setback zones are, they're, they're really vague where we are. And I can see Alberta from where I live, and we used to call that the Wild West. You know, 10, 15 years ago, they had greater setback zones than we do right now. I've found that, uh, you know, my, I used to get really cranky with uh, oil and gas companies, like the representatives and stuff like that, but um, I've stopped doing that because it's, a lot of times they're just doing their job. It's government site regulations, right? So I think that's where we need to tighten up. Um, Next slide, please. Uh, resolve, my daughter is the sixth generation on our farm, and uh, I'm considering, you know, I'm, I'm looking at my options already. 
and I used to have a lot of sentimentality for the land, and that's it's been rapidly disappearing for about a decade, and it, uh, that's kind of what's happening. And uh, that's my uh, really happy speech. <laughs> Thanks. We Canadians are sometimes very understated. Here's a man describing the end of six generations of way of life on land that his family has farmed for decades. And he's not jumping up and down and cursing and swearing. He's just showing us a sad story for all of us to be aware of. Our next speaker we're particularly proud to have with us tonight because he represents a voice that is not only not heard in the world of fracking, but sometimes not even heard at all in the world at large. And that is the voice of our indigenous friends and neighbors. Chief Smagethkem is one of two plaintiffs in a case against Coastal GasLink to try and stop a pipeline going through Wet'suwet'en territory. And his actions, as I think all of us would agree, are being taken on behalf of all of us. And for that reason, in fact, any donations that you leave in the box at the back end will be given to the Wet'suwet'en to advance the work that they're trying to do to protect their land. So I am delighted to have Chief Smagethkem here tonight. Denise, is that you? Taka, is that you? Sky, is that you? My name is Smogothkam. I am a hereditary chief of the Sun House, of the Laksamusu clan of the Wet'suwet'en Nation. Not the Wet'suwet'en First Nation, it's the Wet'suwet'en Nation. Uh, I, have to make a, I have to make that really explicit because there is a Wet'suwet'en First Nation and it's a band. And it's a band, it's an elected band system that has actually signed deals with pipeline companies. We are the Wet'suwet'en Nation, not the Wet'suwet'en First Nation. So if you're doing a report, or if you're writing an article, or you're going to write about this later, make that distinction very clear. I hold a hereditary chief name that, um, that has been around for thousands of years. And it's a rich history. It's a rich history that is kind of explained a bit more in in the context of um, our people moving through the lands that a lot of people call Northern BC. I lived in a place called Unistoten Camp for eight years. And um, for one year I stayed there by myself with a small group of supporters while many of the Unistoten went about their lives. I lived out there and took care of the place and we kept pipeline workers out of there. I think it was November 24th. My mother was in home palliative care. She was, she was dying. And I chose to spend all my time with her since October 5th when my family first found out about it, her health. <clears throat> As many of you understand, losing parents that are really close to you, it's one of the most difficult parts of your life. But on November 24th, I was by her bedside, taking care of her, feeding her, bringing her water, giving her the medication that she needed to make it through. She was dealing with kidney failure. And we got a knock on the door at my mom's house. And it was, um, it was a guy delivering a notice of claim from the Coastal Gasoline Pipeline Project. They delivered it to my mom, to my dying mother's house. And they served me with a notice that I was going to be taken to court and held responsible for billions of dollars of loss from the Coastal Gasoline Pipeline Project and also a notice of claim stating that they were going to be applying for an in, a permanent injunction against us. 
On December 14th of last year, we made it into court. I think I had about um, two and a half weeks. No, it was less than two weeks from when I actually found a lawyer until we were sitting in court. Um, meanwhile, the Coastal Gassing Pipeline Company was, they showed up to court, they had five binders. They're accompanied by the legal representative for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. They had government officials sitting with them, former government officials sitting with them. All of my fellow head chiefs showed up. We weren't allowed to wear our regalia in the courtroom, but we sat in the front and made it really obvious that we were there. And we listened to our lawyer give it his best shot in the less than two weeks that he had to prepare for that case. And as expected, the, as many of you have heard, the court injunction was granted against our people. And a pipeline company was cheering. They're excited. They left the courtroom really excited, hugging each other. And the chiefs of the Wutsuta Nation walked out of the courtroom in dismay and disgust, but also with the expected results that we saw come out of that. Ten years ago, when we first got wind of these pipeline projects attempting to traverse over our territories, actually it was in 1996 I did this. Um, 1996 I, I, I did, I, 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 I work as a researcher. That's my profession. Um, I do ethnographic research, but I also used to teach um, environmental monitoring for the Northwest, Northwest Community Colleges in Northern BC, as well as the Northern Lakes Community Colleges in Northern Alberta. And I had an opportunity to visit Fort Chippewan. Many of you might have heard of Fort Chippewan. It's right in the middle of the tar sands. The people there were dying from alarming rates of rare cancers. I was up there teaching for three months, and there were young people in my class that were getting diagnosed with cancers as well. I had to give the students breaks through that three months, three separate breaks, to allow them to go back to the community hall and participate in funerals that were happening. The day before I landed to teach in that teaching gig, a 28-year-old man was being buried there. He also died from a rare form of cancer. When I left for Chippewan, I told the community as I was leaving that that place changed my life. I couldn't fathom the idea of continuing on the work that I was doing with the ethnographic research from an unbiased position. We were watching people die in these communities. And at that time, there were 13 separate proposed pipelines that wanted to cross over our territories. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. So, so um, next slide, please. So I did a, I did a interesting use study for my people. This is in 2007, and uh, I went in as an ethnographic researcher. I explained, you know, this is the size of the pipeline that they want to put in. This is a Pacific Trail uh, pipeline. It was a LNG pipeline. It's proposed to cross over our territories. I explained it in layman terms. I went through all the technical reports and sat down with our community members individually and as a collective to talk about the impacts that I knew of just based on our technical reports. And people had a chance to listen to, in layman terms, this is what the company wants to do. This is the size of the, the corridor they want to put in. And um, every one of our people, 100% of our people said no. 
They said, if we let these guys in, there's not enough evidence in there to say that it's going to be a safe project. There's actually a lot of evidence to say that it's going to be a very unsafe project. And we don't want it in here. I wrote a lengthy, detailed report and submitted it to the Ministry of Environment, who had the contract to do this work with. They were glad they got it. They said it was the most comprehensive report that they've seen come into their office. But when they received it, they shelved it. Less than a month later, they started issuing reports or issuing permits to the Pacific Shores Pipeline Project. And that's when I realized that my job was useless. The work that I, doing, that I was doing was of no consequence to the decision makers, the true traditional decision makers of our lands, our hereditary chiefs in our communities. And I felt like I had to do something. So, next slide. In 2008, uh, the Wet'suwet'en chiefs decided to opt out of the British Columbia Treaty Commission process. Next slide. In 2009, the Unistoten constructed a cabin on route to the proposed pipeline. That was the Enbridge pipeline that wanted to come through the northern part of BC. And that received a lot of opposition, incredible opposition from all over BC, including here in Vancouver. Communities from everywhere stood up and spoke at the hearings and said that this is why we don't want this pipeline here. It has to, it has to be stopped. Next. In 2013, we built a pit house that was constructed on the path of the proposed coastal gasoline pipeline project. That's an interesting structure. It's, um, I, I also have a background in archaeology. I worked as an archaeologist for quite a while. And um, I studied a lot of my own people's history. I spent a lot of time growing up um, talking with elders and um, elders in our community about our past and how we lived our lives. And I had the inspiration of like one day doing stuff that our ancestors did. And I had the opportunity at Unistotan Camp to construct a pit house. The location, the, the location of the pit house um, wasn't deliberate, although it sounds like it's deliberate, and the company is probably going to say it was deliberate. But was li or I was literally walking with a, like an eight-year-old girl. She was Unistotan. And she came out to visit her auntie. And I was on snowshoes with her, and I was walking through the snow with her, and I told her that I was interested in building a pit house for her people. And I said, you're going to be the next leader of your people. All of, your, all of the Unistotu people are saying that you're going to be their next leader. You're going to be the next Nidipis. Where do you want this pit house? And she was eight years old. She's like, uh, maybe I'll tell you when I see a spot, a really good spot. I said, OK. So we just kept walking through the snow. And we're still walking, and she stopped at one spot, and she said, I think this would be a really good spot right here. And I said, oh, show me where the center of the pit house should go. So she walked to the middle of the little flat area and held onto a tree and said, I think this should be the center. So I marked it off with ribbon. And the first part of spring came, and we went back out to that spot. And we started to excavate and clear the area. And we began the construction of this pit house. It just so happens that the pit house location was, was decided to be right on the center point of the proposed coastal gassing pipeline project. And it was amazing just to kind of go through that process. Uh, next slide. In 2014, we built the bunkhouse out on our territory. And my friend Dave Ages is here. Um, his brother Bob is over here as well. Um, these two came out um, and visited us for their first time. And we were living in a little cabin, and all of the supporters that came out to work with us and spend, spend winters with us and summers with us stayed in a little cabin. And they got a chance to see exactly how cramped it was. There's literally people sleeping under the kitchen table. Um, it was really, really packed. Like I think we were 15 people living in there at that time. And they got a chance to spend time with us, and they, they asked me, like, they said, well, I'm a fundraiser, and 
I, I, and the other guy says, like, the other brother's like, I build, play, I build things. I love building things. What would be your dream project? And I said, well, you guys had a chance to sleep in the cabin. We need sleeping quarters for people. We need people. We need, we need a place where people can sleep comfortably. So we went and paced out an area of, um, an area of land right on the camp site. And we decided that the, we were going to build a bunkhouse. And they did fundraising that year. But 2014, we constructed this beautiful bunkhouse to house people. And it's still there today. The, the painting on it is something I did a while ago for an art project that I did with a bunch of youth for summer. And it depicts um, what we call a mincet in our language. It's, a, it's an unistot and mythical creature that flies endlessly and never lands. And it flies over their, their traditional territories and monitors them. And if anything is spotted out of the ordinary on their lands, the mincet comes and visits the elders and the medicine people of the Unistotan and shows them where this thing is occurring and instructs them in the dream to go and find it and stop it. So that's what this is. It's a, it's a hawk. And the people that are, like you see figures on both sides. That's a, th those are the sequences of hereditary chiefs who have gone. And the more present one on the right is Warner William Hill, the name Native Beast. And on the far right is Frida Hewson. So it shows all the leaders of the, of the Unistotan on, on the bunkhouse. And it's a beautiful project. Okay, next slide. From 2015 to 2018, we had three phases of this project. And it was really more like four because there was a lot of finishing work that needed to be done on, on last year. But um, we built a healing center. And again, we were approached and asked if we had another dream project after the construction of the bunkhouse went up. And we just said, well, a healing center would be amazing. And I was asked to draft up a design of what one might look like. So I drafted up this L-shaped building. And lo and behold, like the next year, the construction phase for this healing center started. And it's still underway. There's, um, most of the building is complete, but there's still a lot of landscaping that needs to happen around the site. And the Unistotan have been taking in, um, they've been taking in clients. There's, there's clients living there right now that have gone there to look for healing. One of my friends um, lived for, I think, 11 years on a downtown east side. And I came down to pick him up. And I brought him up there. And he spent an entire winter up there right now, completely alcohol and drug free. He learned how to trap. He learned how to eat healthy. He learned how to take care of himself. And he's put on a lot of weight. He's an he's amazing, amazing human being. He's an old friend of mine from high school. Another young man and his, and his partner just left the camp. And they struggled with um, chronic alcoholism. They both struggled a lot with that. They grew up in it, and they struggled like they wanted to beat it. And they spent the whole winter out there with us as well. And they just left, completely drug and alcohol free. I just talked with them before I came down. He stopped me and said uh, he wanted to thank me for spending my, spending my time out there with them and helping him on his journey. And I just encouraged him to keep doing what he was doing. The place is a beacon of hope for people who are trying to stand up for the environment, but it's also a beacon of hope for people who want to get healthy. And they both go hand in hand. Next slide. As I said, November 23rd, the injunction was served to me. That's my mother. She was sleeping. And I took that picture right after I got the injunction served to me, and I read the first two notices of claim. The cowardice of human beings to do something like this, to serve somebody while they're dealing with their mother in palliative care is an unimaginable, but it happens. It's not the first time that the company's done this. The company's done this before. They've done it to, to us when my good friend Gordy Holland passed away. They decided to call drillers out to do some drilling under one of the rivers back in Unistotan territory, and the drillers were so pissed off. They said there was so much disrespect from the company that they said, if you want to stop us from going in and drilling, 
We're scheduled to go in there at 5 o'clock in the morning, and you guys can stop us at that bridge. That pipeline worker, he's with us. You can make sure you kick him out. And we don't care if our jobs are online. Because that pipeline worker kept telling them, you have to get out there. You have to get out there. They're dealing with something. They're busy. We, can, we have a window of opportunity to get there and get this work done. So we went out and stopped them. And I drove to the very back of the territory. And uh, they had all their drilling equipment that have already flown out. But um, when we stopped them at the bridge, we turned them around. And I told them, you have five days to get your stuff out. Five days to get all of your stuff out of here. I don't care how you do it. Get your stuff out of here and don't come back. Five days later, they had giant helicopters out there in the middle of a snowstorm, pulling all that, drip, that the drilling equipment out. We successfully kept that company out. Next slide. Many of you know January 7th. Actually, I want to go a bit past. Uh, b before this, um, December 14th is when that decision was made for the injunction. But on January 7th, I was with my family picking out the casket for my mom in a funeral home in a little town called Terrace in northern British Columbia. And I was watching the stuff unfold online on my phone, watching my friends get arrested while I was literally picking a casket out for my mom. My hands were tied from doing anything. I had obligations as a hereditary chief and as a leader of my clan, but I had obligations as a brother and as a son and as a dad that superseded my obligations that I held so dearly before in protecting those territories. And I watched my friends get arrested, violently arrested by the RCMP. Next slide. The Gidimden access point was torn down by a coastal gassing pipeline shortly after the raid. The RCMP occupied the Gidimden camp themselves and took it over. They were eating the food and drinking the water that was left there by the land defenders. And we decided that they, they had no use for it anymore. They let the coastal gassing pipeline come in with their equipment and begin tearing apart the Gidimden camp because all those people were arrested and removed and they're prohibited from coming back. Next slide. From January until present, there's an update that I want to give to people. There's um, an injunction hearing that will be made in between May 27th and 29th in Prince George in the BC Supreme Courthouse. And incidentally, I think this year is going to be the 150th birthday for the Supreme Court of British Columbia. And they're set to make a decision on people who have enforced their laws, enforced their jurisdiction, enforced their authority for more than 13,000 years. It's ridiculous. We've kept that place clean and healthy for future generations for thousands of years. And a court that's less than 150 years old is set to make a decision and they're more than likely going to try and make a decision against us. But we're fighting hard. Our lawyer and us have spent a lot of time in the last couple of months building a case. And we have a really strong case to make a statement on. Unistote Camp is still fighting CGL. They, they have to let the coastal gassing pipeline come in. They have to let them do their job. Coastal gas line pipeline is literally being escorted to work and from work with our, by the RCMP to avoid any, any confrontation with the peaceful people that live at the camp, at the healing center. CGL is so cowardly that they'll be driving up the road and a group of trappers will be driving by. They head out to go and check the trap line. And CGL will talk on the open radio, the road radio, and tell the RCMP, I think these guys are worthy of stopping and checking out. And the RCMP will say, yes, they've done this a lot of times. They'll turn around and pull over that vehicle and harass them and attempt to intimidate them. People trapping out on the territory back there, 
people going through their own healing journey are being harassed by a public service that is acting as a security force for a petroleum pipeline company. Get him then access point is resurrected. Uh, I don't know if many of you attended some of the other um, um, gatherings like this over the past few days, but Molly Wickham uh, talked about it. Uh, they've resurrected their camp. They they built new structures up and they they reoccupied Get Him Done Access Point again. <laughs> the Taiyu Clan or the Beaver Clan is the beginning. They're, they're beginning to construction of a, of a cabin out on their territory, which sits past where Unistotan Camp is. The Laksamisu, the clan that I belong to, are in the process of building a camp. I left Unistotan Camp right when my mom died. I made the decision that I had to leave and I had to do something else with my life. And the first thing that my clan did, my matriarchs and my chiefs and my elders did, was they sat me down and they said, we put you in here as the head chief of our people because you know how to protect territories. And it's your responsibility and your job to make sure our territories are gonna be protected. So from now on, you work for us. So I began this journey, this latest journey in my life that, that I've been passionate about for years. And we've had quite a few meetings as clans to begin these talks about how we're going to reoccupy our lands, how we're going to move back out to our, our territories and begin protecting it. We have a plan this summer. We're going to start building a cabin. We're going to be building some outbuildings. Some of the clan members have already jumped the jumped ahead of the game and purchased some horses. So we need to build a horse stable out there. Um, they've also purchased some Karelian bear dogs. So I've got to build a kennel out there to take care of these beautiful animals. And we have a log cabin that we're going to be building this summer and many outbuildings like um, woodsheds and, and um, kitchens and bunkhouses and stuff like that. We're going to be really busy this spring. We have a spring construction camp planned. And that starts um, throughout the month of May. It's uh, April 28th until May 18th. If people are interested, you're welcome to come and check it. I've got cards I'll be handing out. Okay, next slide. So we have the spring construction camp. Like I said, living quarters, outbuildings, kitchens, and a bunkhouse. Um, other Lexamasu members are planning on building their own cabins up there this summer. They've, uh, they've got the funds in place, and they're just eager to get out there. This young lady. My cousin Sarah, she wants to build out there with her brother. She wants to build a cabin and she wants to move out onto the territory and live out there like our ancestors have. Uh, we plan on doing a fall construction camp. And this is the exciting part. Uh, we want to build a climate change research center. As David Suzuki said, we can't, we can't put a big enough explanation mark on the urgency of doing something like this. But we can't let colonization lead us through that process. In order for us to make any difference in the climate change that's happening, it's kicking down our front door right now, we need to make sure that we have indigenous people, indigenous decision makers taking that lead. We have to do that. We're the ones that are taking the biggest risks right now. We're the ones taking the biggest risks, why? Because we have a solid connection to those territories. When people ask me, when, what connection do you have to those territories? What I've been telling them is, you can dig anywhere in North America. Dig down as deep as you can go. You're gonna find genetic evidence of the people who've been there for thousands of years because we've been here so long. We've been here so long. We know that inherently as indigenous people, we can feel it. That's why we have so many powerful ceremonies. Some people might not really understand this ceremony. They might think it's like an abstract idea. But to us, it's physical. It's purely physical and spiritual. Next slide. So um, this is Parrot Lake. This is where we're going to build our cabin and our climate change research center. My uncle, Zahail, the guy that was in a previous photo with me, um, He's a general contractor by trade, and he's retired. He retired uh, two years ago, but he's coming out of retirement. He's, a, he's, um, he's an old warrior 
from the Delgamuk days, when our people took the Canadian government to court. We were the plaintiffs and we fought them in court. We went right to the Supreme Court of Canada. There were blockades all over Gitsan and Wet'suwet'en territory. My uncle is the one who orchestrated all of those. And the work that I was doing woke that part of them up. And when I went back to my people and I stopped working for the Unisdotem people and volunteering for them, he was one of the first ones to approach me and say, we have to do something. All the work that you've been doing all these years inspired me to do something. I mean, I'm not going to do it by myself, but I'm going to help you. So that's what we're going to be doing now. Next slide. So to contact us, we have a um, few websites here. There's the uh, www.luxamisu.com, unisdotencamp.com, and if you Google search, get them to an access point. Um, they've got contact information that you can probably find, I think, on the Unisdotan camp page on how to, how to help them. But um, we're here for the long run. We're not going anywhere. Our people have been here for thousands of years. Uh, we've survived so many things from colonization and we're gonna survive this as well. And we're gonna win. We know it. So we've started from the biggest picture, the planetary picture with David Suzuki. We've heard about the regional picture in northeastern and northwestern BC. You've heard about a settler who came and lived, his family lived on the land and looked after it the way it's always been looked after. And now we've heard about the deep roots of indigenous peoples in the land. And there's a spirit afoot of change, I think, that says enough already. And we're not just saying it because it's a protest. We're saying it's because it's a survival tactic. If the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, 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 change is saying, is the, saying same the same as our, as our indigenous our friends and neighbors have been, have been saying, saying to us ever, ever since we arrived, arrived on this continent, continent, then I then think, I it's, think time it's time that we listen to them and we got the two sides of this story together to lead us away from the morass that we're heading towards. Our final speaker tonight is going to be somebody who is actually working on moving away from, in particular, the requirement and the, uh, the obsessive attraction to extractive industries, whether it's forestry, mining, oil and gas, or any of the other industries that have sprung up that we have made the centerpiece of our culture. And that is looking at deriving the energy that we all appreciate. You wouldn't be hearing me very well if I didn't have a little electrical energy flowing through this little device in my hand. So we value and appreciate the energy, but we have to derive it in a way that does not destroy the world in which we live. So now you're going to hear Don Pettit from Dawson Creek, who's been for several decades implementing and facilitating the establishment of renewable energy projects. The Bear Mountain Wind Farm, which unfortunately displaced some indigenous trap lines, and that is something that we should not be, we should not gloss over. But nevertheless, it brought a form of energy in that does not destroy the planet. Now he's working on solar energy because the number of terabytes sorry, terajoules of energy that come from the sun is extraordinary. And it uh, uh, gives us a sort of energy that we take in rather than dragging out of the depths of our planet. So I'm going to turn this over to Don, who is visible on the screen. Don, can you hear us? Yes, I certainly can. Can you hear me? We just, we just started, started to hear you. you. <laughs> Thank you, Don, and, and we're, we're interested, interested in hearing what you have to, you have to say. say. Thank, you, Thank very you very much. Okay, so you can hear me and everything's good. Okay. Uh, okay, my name is Don Pettit. I'm Executive Director of Peace Energy Renewable Energy Cooperative up here in Dawson Creek. We were Western Canada's first renewable energy cooperative. We were established in 2003, and we've now got about 500 members. 
Uh, just very briefly, my personal story, I moved up to Dawson Creek in 1974 from Vancouver, looking for a more rural lifestyle, and I certainly found it up here back then. Beautiful country, beautiful people. I was a professional nature photographer. But very quickly, I began to uh, deal with the uh, various industries moving into the region and became quite an active environmental advocate and have been ever since. Um, but you know, after a, a couple of decades of fighting and campaigning and letter writing and starting environmental groups of one form or another, you know, I quite honestly kind of burned out. And I had to kind of come to terms with my own limitations and basically decided to turn 180 degrees. And I decided to put all my effort into building the world I would like to see. In other words, I would solve the problems I was dealing with by creating the answers. That's when I helped start Peace Energy Cooperative uh, which we intentionally uh, designed to have a 100% positive uh, approach. That is, we promote clean energy, we build clean energy infrastructure, and we provide clean energy education and job training. Our message overall is very straightforward and clear. It's one I think you've been hearing from uh, the media and, uh, quite a bit these days, but I'll just say it again. Uh, we, we now must move into the most dramatic and important energy transition in human history. This is our one chance. This shift to clean energy will be to the energies of wind, solar, geothermal, conservation, efficiency, and others. These provide clear answers to our global problems. These are not experimental and new. These are robust and mature energy sources. They offer tremendous opportunities for jobs and wealth creation a much cleaner environment and the only real answer to climate change. In other words, we know what the problems are. We know how to fix them and the tools to do so are now in our hands. So a brief history of our cooperative, I think Zealous illustrates this, this our history and our positive message. Um, we started with our first big project after forming in 2003 was Bear Mountain Wind Park. This was BC's first commercial wind facility, quite large at 102 megawatts. The co our cooperative initiated this project and was deeply involved during the two-year environmental assessment, which was uh, uh, also followed la later by five years of follow-up studies uh, and the six years of planning and construction. Our, our cooperative, I think, set a pretty high standard for community-based wind development. We deeply engaged our community and, we're showing, and then we had to partner with industry to make it actually happen. So I think we demonstrated how communities can work with industry for the common good. If you've got a reasonably enlightened industry and we are We could talk all evening about the wind industry that we helped launch in the Peace Region, got well underway up here, but then collapsed, apparently due to government indifference and policy changes at the highest level. It's just good to know that the Peace Country and the province of British Columbia could now have a vibrant and growing wind industry, at least some of it. So does the whole province of British Columbia, not just the Peace Region. So we offer a steady stream of public education seminars around solar. We're running training courses for installers at our local college, and we're, and we're designing and installing solar arrays all across Northeast BC and elsewhere, providing jobs and opportunities. And actually, one of these projects we just completed, I, I've got a short video. Warren, do you think we have time to show it? It's three and a half minutes. I guess we'll go ahead. Um, we call it, you don't have to be big to be green because this uh, very large uh, solar installation was just recently completed by, by our cooperative in a small community of Hudson's Hope up here in Northeast British Columbia. This is now the largest municipal solar installation in the province. And that makes little old Hudson's Hope the most solarized community per capita 
in Western Canada. So if you want to just sit back for a couple of minutes, we'll run this little video. I think you'll enjoy it. And it shows what solar can do uh, for a small community or for any community. I'd like to remind everybody that, as I said earlier, any donations that come in tonight will go to the Wet'suwet'en. And I'd also mention that uh, our initial speaker, David Suzuki, is going to be speaking um, on May the 7th. Uh, among other Indigenous leaders, he will be speaking with Indigenous leaders um, at an event around the Wet'suwet'en uh, protest and pipeline resistance. Uh, May the 7th, 7 p.m. at 3214 West 10th Avenue. I have no idea what the building is, if that's a public building. Well, there you are, <laughs> the same crowd. All right, the, the posters are gonna be on the back table, so if you're interested in attending, that will be available to you. We've got a name, now we just need a face. We have a.
It looks, I see, the, I see somebody's back heading out a door. <laughs> that augurs poorly for Don participating in again. Um, tonight we had planned to have a uh, question and answer period. And we have to modify that because as you, if you look at your watch, you'll see it's just about 9 o'clock. But our speakers are going to stay with us, I trust, for a while. Well, some of them have to stay because I'm driving them to their hotel. <laughs> and they would be delighted to talk to you if you have further questions and you'd like to know more about what you can do. Uh, we have also prepared a small card, which is available at the back. And I have a sample here. On one side, it says, what are the issues? We've prepared it as the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. What are the issues? And on the back, what can I do? These are practical suggestions, many of which will be familiar to you, but also some may not and may augment your suite of responses to the existential crisis, as David called it, David Suzuki called it, that we are now facing. So those will be available at the back as well. So I want to thank the people who have come here tonight in this room to speak. Chief Smagethgum, I hope I pronounced that right. Close. Close is good. <laughs> Carl Matson, Ulrike Meyer, family physician, and uh, um, Karen Levin, who is, who is um, she said before she came, she said, I'm not good at public speaking, but she has over the week, she is, she's not bad at all. <laughs> I want to... I also want to thank three people who have been central to this process who are here tonight. Um, there's one in Victoria, Celia Walker, who can't be with us. But in the front row here is Melissa Lem. In the back is with, the, uh, with his blue shirt is Larry Barzilai. And farther back somewhere is Margaret McGregor, hiding behind a post probably. <laughs> These are three family physicians who have each in their own way contributed enormously to this project. Melissa has been the source of the imagery you see on the screen at this moment, and also uh, an article that she's written about Ulrike's experience in um, Dawson Creek, and generally kept us on track with respect to getting the details right with respect to how we present this whole issue and the, the process we've gone through, the five city um, panel discussions. The person who's really kept this project going, whose idea it was in the first place, and who has done, I don't know how many phone calls he's made to various people to get them to come here, but Dr. Larry Barzilai at the back has been the nerve center for this process, and every time we didn't know what was going on, Larry would make about 10 phone calls and something good would come out of it. So I want to thank all three of them on your behalf because they are the reason why this is being a, such a success. Thank you very much. And I want to thank all of you for coming out here. This is, in fact, the largest presentation we've done on our tour. And just from the way you've been responding, it's clear that you not only know a lot about these issues, but you care about them a lot. And I think that is what we need to start doing collectively. This is not, this is not for sissies, as they say. This is a serious thing that we have to work on, all of us, together. I said at an earlier uh, presentation that what we're probably doing is we're trying to become better at expressing love. I pointed out that a physician saying love in public in front of a lot of people is an odd thing. But let me explain. I'm not talking about sentimentality or romance. I'm talking about caring for one another and for the planet on which we depend and for all the creatures that inhabit it with us that actually we are totally dependent on for survival. We have no choice but to actually start to manifest that kind of, what they call in Greek, agape, that kind of love that's sort of indiscriminate. It just says, you're here, you're part of us. We are part of the land, we are part of each other, and the more we express that and live it in our lives and act on that understanding, the closer we will come to a solution to our existential crisis. So thank you all for coming out. I hope you go from here moved, but also inspired to act as you already have in many respects in your lives.
to do what we all know we have to do. Thank you very much.